border patrol, women under the new Taliban, labor strikes, people are fighting back, and a review of the new movie about Aretha Franklin called Respect, or R-E-S-B-C-T. Well, yeah, that's, yeah, what it means to me. So thank you. That's all. And if you ever come to our hall, you can look through our big bookstore. You'll be there for years. It's like being a kid in a candy shop. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, we also have our uh, common coordinator and, um, and Fred Ray joining us, and she's going to tell you about her apple. Okay, hey everybody. Um, so there's our raffle today, and it's for two books. Uh, it's this book here, Talking Back, Voices of Color, which is a collection of essays from a rainbow of radical voices on topics such as education, racism, healthcare, LGBTQ, immigration, and the penal system, and feminism. And we have Breakfast, Lunch, Dinner by Arnelli Wong. And this is a collection of her poetry. Both of these books are signed. And we're gonna be passing around for people in person a basket where you can buy tickets. It's uh, one ticket for $1, three tickets for $2.50. I'll pass around the basket. Um, you can pay cash into the basket, put it on your tab, take the number of tickets um, that you're paying for. And then for people on Zoom, uh, put into the chat how many tickets you would like, and I will convert those to tickets, and we'll do a draw at the end for both of these books, and one of you lucky folks will, will win one of these books. So, thanks so much. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Ray. And right now I'm going to introduce uh, Nancy Rico Cato, uh, my comrade. Nancy Rico Cato uh, first met Nellie while taking an Asian American studies class at UC Berkeley. After being exposed to working class poets, including Nellie's works, Nancy decided she liked poetry after all. <laughs> Since then, Nancy has spent her life as a union activist in. Uh, UPTE uh, CWA and AFS CME 3299, organizing for reproductive justice and clinic defense, protesting the fascists and building the movements. She is a local and national leader in the Freedom Socialist Party and is honored to be Nellie's comrade. All right, hello everybody. Welcome to this <laughs> This conversation we've been wanting and talking about for so long. Um, it's really an honor, a privilege, and an absolute joy to get to be the person, there's many qualified people for sure, to uh, get to ask yes, uh, no, no, probing questions and <laughs> just to get a better sense of you know, who Nellie Wong is as a revolutionary feminist leader, an activist, a poet, a writer, and a working class hero, frankly. Um, so let me just go ahead. We're going to more focus. Nellie, of course, has been like anthologized in over 200 different publications, including her own works, which how many now? Six. Four, excuse me, I'm, I'm projecting ahead. <laughs> Four books, uh, but again, lots of, uh, been in lots of different publications, which again, speaks to uh, the appeal, the notoriety, the relevance of who Nellie is. 
So, um, like I say, then we'll be focusing more kind of on that other aspect of your life, which you get through her poetry, but also more, you know, to hear some of these stories of the battles that she's been engaged in, because again, they have been quite a few. Um, so Nellie and I drove down to Santa, UC Santa Barbara on the last weekend now, last week. hard to believe, last weekend, for the 40th anniversary of the anthology, This Bridge Called My Back, Writings by Radical Women of Color. So they did a 40th anniversary celebration there, and Nellie was one of the uh, people who was live, who were live, there was a couple other uh, contributors, and then they had um, a wonderful program, which it's, uh, you can see it on, um, on a YouTube video, and hopefully you can put that link up for people to, to take it, the opportunity to, to view that as well. So one of the things I love hanging out with Nelly is that everybody loves Nelly. They love Nelly because of who she is, what she stands for, and her own history. So uh, yeah. Nellie, one of the things that really struck me is just so many young people, right, who always come up to you and how relevant you are to their lives. And I was wondering if maybe you can sort of talk a little bit more about that, right? And, and things that you, the, the questions they ask you, the things that you, you want to share with them, you can maybe share that with us. Thanks, Nancy. Uh, it's been a long road and I'm uh, very happy to be around still to uh, do the work that I've been doing uh, as a poet and as a writer and uh, an activist. And uh, many young people will come up to me. And when I say that, you know that I'm already old, but that's okay. And um, the Issues that I often address and have addressed for a long time now in my writings or in my poetry uh, has to do with who we are, what we're fighting, especially against racism and sexism, and homophobia, and working class rights. So often young people will come up to me and say, oh, I didn't know you were talking about me and I said, well, what are you talking about? And they'll say, well, you, you uh, in a, a poem called, uh, when I was growing up, I talked about um, uh, the fact that uh, being a woman of color, a girl of color, and then later on a woman of color and as an Asian American that um, I faced racism and um, oppression for, for so long that writing the poem, it came out of my life experience, but at the same time, and I didn't really know it at that time, it was dealing with issues that many, many women and women of color and other people of color and working class people were facing. So uh, that really has a lot of meaning for me because I think when I first wrote, wrote that particular piece, uh, starting with, uh, I had longed to be white and uh, just going through that and, and just being able to say it and talk about it, it was no longer, it was not a personal issue. And I really thought that was very important that because of the racism and sexism and homophobia, etc., in this country, engendered by what our system does to um, say some, you know, one one group of people uh, has power over us and oppresses us because we're dark skin or we're queer or we're um, many of those things. So the identification and the connection that I make as uh, someone who's been writing for many years has to do with then actively discussing those issues and reaching out to uh, young people that they too have a battle, but that we're in this battle together. You can also talk a little bit um, about 40 years, right? 40 years of an anthology of writings by radical, and I like that, radical, right? 
women of color and sort of reflecting back, right? Over those 40 years, you're obviously still going. Uh, you've written so much. So where you've been an activist in you know, this entire period. Something um, the way the, what, the whole rest of the English speaking What are your, so your reflections? Did you think that the, the anthology was going to be in its- uh, you, know, you will find any reason not to spell something um, the way that the whole rest of the English speaking world well spells it. It is amazing that uh, this bridge, call my back, writings by radical women of color, is alive and well because of the work published in the seminal anthology of women of color. And when the book began, it, uh, it was the brainchild, if you will, of uh, both. Cherie Moraga and Gloria Azaldua, two Latinas, uh, writers and lesbians and activists who asked some of us to submit writings and when We said, oh, yeah, we we're, were writing, and so we we'll put some uh, pieces in, and from there, and along with many of the other uh, women, radical women of color who uh, submitted pieces in, you know, has grown into this, I don't know what you call it exactly, but it's still being taught uh, as a, um, in a class at UC Santa Barbara. Write 
without the activism and the consciousness of growing up and, and uh, feeling the pangs of racist and sexist behavior uh, uh, and attitudes and actions that were perpetrated, not only against me, but uh, among my sisters and brothers uh, in the different communities. So it was just um, a natural thing, I think, that happened. And uh, little did I understand when I began to write that uh, it opened up a whole new world for me that uh, I needed to have a voice. I was looking for it, and but I didn't know I was. So uh, that beginning action was what introduced uh, me to activism because when I met Rob Woman and Freedom Socialist Party at the San Francisco State University campus, where I was going, to, uh, going uh, as an adult and as a working woman who uh, was going through college for the first time, that um, that began to really open up the paths where the activism and the writing uh, came together. You know, this connection to writing and activism, I think it's really important. Um, someone once told me that the best teachers are the ones who are activists. Right, because they're able to take what is written on a page or what they themselves may write and you know add the sort of you know human element or it's not human, but the element of you know being in touch with people are thinking and feeling at the moment when they're in the streets or doing whatever organizing they're doing. Um, one thing that actually struck me at the Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, this bridge reading was that obviously over 40 years people end up doing different things but uh, my I don't want to speak for everybody in the book because I, I, I can't but one thing I realized and was very clear is that you have remained an activist a revolutionary your entire life and how much that impacts what you have to say and I actually think that's why it resonates so much with people because you're, you, like you said, you're talking about their lives, but you're not talking about their lives 40 years ago, right? You're talking about what's going on today because you're engaged with the community, you're engaged with the issues, you're engaged with, with what's going on in the world today. And I wonder if you might just kind of reflect a little bit on that. Yes, I, I think that if you haven't, first of all, we haven't ever read um, from this bridge call my back, writes by a woman of color, you need to read it. And, uh, but little did we understand with the publication of the book, um, its popularity, if you will, uh, was because it spoke to the issues that women and people of color and LGBTQ people and others, work, working class people were facing in this society and in their communities and on their jobs or, in, or anywhere they are uh, in the workplace and, and otherwise. So I think that what was what's really relevant today uh, on why this bridge upon my back is uh, still being taught and being read is that the issues that we were discussing then via the writings in the book are really issues also of today. Because when I think about it and the, um, the killings of black and brown people by the police, uh, the rollback towards our rights, towards women's rights to decide what to do with their own bodies on the road v. way issue. And that issue is being discussed in the Supreme Court now, and we may lose that. And all kinds of things, and, and, and what happens to working people and immigration and the uh, white supremacy, all the different things really come into play when you think about what, 
wait a minute, we, we were discussing some of these things way back 40 years ago. And, we're, and so the issues that were being addressed then in the book uh, were not, they're not dead issues. They're alive, they're a part of our lives and what happens in the system that oppresses us. So I think that uh, in particular at the event, when um, some uh, three of us were on the uh, panel discussion, uh, it opened up for me when comments were being made. And I, I, I said that, well, we need to really find the joy in uh, fighting back. And I, I think that's part of our lives. And what are we fighting for? We're fighting really for a healthier and a, a better society and where education should be free and uh, uh, that women should be able and continue to be able to have a legal access to abortion on demand and all those other issues that we've been facing and fighting as women of color and our in our communities, so that I, it just is as soon as it, and uh, this is still happening. So what is going on? So I think that's the connection to what is the past is really not the past, but the past is also right now and what we're fighting for. So I'm really uh, proud of and, and thrilled to be in that community of the women who are women of color who are writing for this bridge on my back. And then even now as to what we're doing and the fight continues because we're still facing the issues of uh, today that are horrendous. I'm also reminded that um, Red Letter Press, which is a Freedom Socialist Party's publication, um, we came out with Voices of Color and also Talking Back, another anthology. And I feel that that is the continuum of the legacy of where this bridge started from, but we as a party and in those anthologies have been able to build upon it, which I think is again exciting to take something and then continue with it. Um, I also just wanted to point out at the UC Santa Barbara event, Nelly was the one who basically said we need to have socialism, right? And it was just like in front of everybody. And this is so Nelly. <laughs> Nellie okay. talks about what needs to be said, and she is unafraid. She is, she'll just put it out there. And I think that is something that is quite admirable, right? You don't care if maybe there's people, and you know there's people who don't want to hear it, right? Certain people, but especially in 2021, there's far more people who do want to hear it. And she was telling me that a black professor came up to her afterwards and said, oh, I'm so glad you mentioned socialism, right? And um, so talk about both the pleasures and also maybe perhaps some of the pressures you have faced of being an open, you know, Trotskyist feminist, revolutionary feminist activist in, in, in the variety of different movements from the left to the labor movement, to the feminist movement, to the people of color movements. Well, oh, I, I think about that because, you, you know, I, I'm like a lot of other women and People, people who want to be popular, we want to be thin, we want to be cute, <laughs> and we want to attract men and, you know, worry about all those things that are supposedly defining us. And so, uh, it, 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 I, it's not simple or easy to talk about your, uh, beliefs and your principles as someone who wants to make change, radical social change, because I think it's really important, well, for me to just let you know that for so many years, I thought that it was my fault because I was born a little darker than my sisters. And uh, somehow, if I wasn't good at math, that's really my fault. You just don't have a brain for that. And, um, and being told that I couldn't do certain things because I was a girl. 
and that uh, because I'm Chinese, so oh, your English is so perfect. And then someone else tell you, oh, well, I didn't know you were Chinese. And oh, but you don't sound like a Chinese. All those different things that come to my head that had been a part of my life, I, I, I know were also a part of other people's lives. So I think that the connection of, um, of um, what is supposedly your problem and your personal issues indeed are not my or our personal problems. That is out there because of the political pressures that we face and the uh, race and sex and class oppression that we face are indeed connected to what's going on into the world and, and, and that my understanding and coming to that is because of the political activism and my being part of uh, the Freedom Social Party and well as radical, radical women and many of the other uh, community organizations that I've been a part of or uh, fighting back uh, racism and fighting against racism and, and sexism in, in particular. So those issues just come together and the writing is so connected that now I realize that even though I thought I was writing a personal, really a personal a poem, that it's really not personal. And I think that that and and, and what came out in uh, this bridge on my back and in other collections and in anthologies that have collected our, our work I speak to that voice and the voices that are necessary uh, to really not validate our own lives so much, but to discuss what's going out there in an economic system that says, uh, too bad you're poor, or too bad you're a person of color, or too bad you're queer, or whatever issues that you live as a person and how that is connected. And particularly, I think to us as workers, in the world that have helped to build this country uh, you know, way back from slavery on and why Blacks were brought here from uh, Africa and other parts of the world and, and what Chinese and, and, and different workers have brought to the building of this country and yet you know we're thrown away like we don't count and, and we're paid less and because we're women or that some of us cannot ever uh, make it to college or that we in, in, uh, incur uh, millions of dollars in debt because we're students and want to have an education. So all those issues all come together and um, it's, it's just really, I, I find it really very exciting to be, well, it's not easy, you know, read the newspapers and you, read books and such, and, and, and you go through what you, you do in life and you say, well, what else can I do but then to take an active part in fighting for us to be uh, alive and to be well and, and, and not to uh, be sick because we're poor and because we don't have the money to uh, take care of our children. Okay, so there's lots of writers and activists who can really do a great job of explaining the ills of society, right? Um, they can, they're, they're, you know, it's, it's moving even, but okay, but you're the one, one of the folks out there saying, we need to have a revolution. We need to have a socialist feminist revolution. That's not as popular as to say capitalism sucks, right? So what is it that allows you literally just to stand up on a stage or to stand in front of a microphone and promote socialism in the United States of America, right? I mean, there's a lot of pressure not to do that. I mean, I'm sure we've all seen folks that we have known, especially over time, maybe got a little more softer about things, but you have been rock steady, you know, the entire time I've known you. Um, in fact, I think I'm probably even getting stronger on the, on, the, on the issue of a need to, you know, get rid of the profit system, given we were really, you know, even more impacted by it because of COVID. 
Yes, I think, and what's happening today <clears throat> has a lot to do, and in recent years, uh, has a lot to do with keeping me, I think, alive and, 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 and I like to say thriving, even though I suffer from arthritis and other issues and, and, and aging and those things, but it's almost as if, you know, I want to do what I can. And it's personal as well as political what I do, because if I were left to my own devices, I could be a victim forever. I could not really say that I'm doing something to help make change. And that's so important to me. I, and I don't know why, because I think that, I mean, the, the whole thing about being public and private and, and uh, just wanting to, to see things better. I mean, I mean, when I pick up the newspaper and, and, or watch the news and television and such, I mean, I just want to cry. And I do cry, but the other things is that, wait, there's some things that we can do, there's something wrong, and what can we do to not only correct this, but make our lives better for everyone, especially uh, those who are being tortured, uh, whether they're political prisoners and what the Black Panthers and other Black revolutionaries uh, have faced and what and why this country um, has the highest number of men and women largely people of color in prison more than any other country. And we're supposed to be the richest country in the world. We're supposed to be the most democratic country in the world. That says so much to me that there's not anything that I can really ignore. We can't do everything, but I myself can't do everything on my own. So I'm organizing with like-minded people in uh, an organization like the Freedom Socialist Party and in Radical Women and in other groups to fight for those changes that, so that we can really see ourselves and not only um, have to have white supremacists pounding on our heads that somehow we don't belong. And so, I mean, that the, those connections to me as who we are, that, you know, I said, you know, I was, well, I have to say this because I, I love fantasy. I love the movies, I love books. And I used to think that I could, you know, be like Doris Day or Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> and uh, it was way for maybe a film like Shang-Chi just came out and and to see our, our faces on the screen or, or, or uh, being heroes. And I'm, I'm part of my uh, strive and, and, and dedication and, and changes that came to me is that, um, well, you know what? Now, there may, maybe you need to figure out how you can become your own hero. And uh, so, so those are just some of the things that make the connection to me. And then, uh, and, and when I see um, mothers and fathers and uh, parents, then, you know, uh, how, how do they feed their kids? And, and how do we actually provide for them and give them an education? All those issues come together for me. Oh, you want me to move in? All right. <laughs> okay, so All right. I, I, I'm sorry if I went on a little bit long there, but I was lots of stuff. This is a conversation. <laughs> so yeah, you get to do that. 
Um, you have been involved in so many different movements, right? And uh, some of the issues, well, not some, many, all the issues are still come up. So you've had to fight against, you know, uh, single issue politics, which basically have said, oh, we can only talk about this one issue. So for instance, abortion. You can only talk about abortion. Don't bring in all the other stuff because it's just going to confuse people. You have, you know, been shouted down or censored or not been invited or been disinvited because you're an open, you know, Trotskyist, feminist, radical revolutionary. Um, you've stood up to homophobia as a straight, you know, person. Um, you dealt with, you know, cultural nationalism in movements where it's, you know, we're only going to deal with just our race. You know, we're not going to talk about other races or tell other races what to do. So, share some share some some of your experiences around dealing with those types of um, you know political differences that hold back the movements, and also because you're an out you know socialist feminist, um, you know additional pressures that you have faced. Yeah, I think that that's a really <coughs> good to bring out, Nancy, because. It seems that wherever I've turned, um, I'm told to either shut up or don't talk about it, those kinds of things. And I think in particular one, there was a conference that I attended um, and it was lesbians of color conference. But many of us went to, and I went as a part of Radical Women, and uh, Miss Way Yamada, who's in the film Miss Way Nelly, Asian American Poets with me, has said we went as activists, and we went as writers, and we went as women of color. And when we got there, well, uh, uh, Miss Way and I ha had a chance to speak. And, well, we were told that we were criticized for being there because we were straight women of color. And what were we doing there at a lesbian of color conference? Instead of seeing that how can we build our solidarity in fighting back racism and homophobia and uh, uh, sexist oppression, um, because we weren't gay or we weren't or you can't do this or you can't do that and then other other uh and we dealt with those by speaking out against that and had support definitely uh at that particular conference for uh to our, our rights not to free, also on the freedom of speech and to stand up for uh, other oppressed minorities or racial or sexual or and, and otherwise. And then, but another time then, you know, somehow I'm never gonna be Asian enough to be Asian American, I'm not black, so I can't speak to those issues. And I we're also we're always being told that to be quiet and just show one aspect or speak to one aspect of our lives of, as human beings. And I said, well, how can we move things forward if we can't speak about various issues and fight on a multiracial basis and organizing together and instead of being separated? I mean, you know, like, Black people don't want to be separated into a so-called black belt in the United States. They want to be integrated, and I stand with them, but integrated in a revolutionary sense and in a political sense and in a practical as well as in a uh, sense that we have our lives and we should not be discriminated against and oppressed because we are of a certain color or because of our sexuality or because that we speak with an accent, whatever, if you will. So, I mean, you know, those, those kinds of things that I face 
but also I have been faced by a lot of other people. So that makes a connection to me. Well, what do we do about it? Because it's not only personal issues, but political issues and practical issues as well. So you made me think of another question. Oh, so, <laughs> all right. All right. So as Asian Americans, right, we're not seen as black nor white, or maybe actually we're stereotyped to be more white because we're quote unquote the bottom minority. So when you talk about multiracial organizing, right, and multiracial unity, we have people tell us we are not allowed to speak or you shouldn't speak for other groups, right? That's not our place. Right, that somehow only the groups themselves, but but as we know, any racial, any group, doesn't matter if it's racial or gender or whatnot, there's a spectrum, right? You can't say only that group because within it there's like sexism. So it's like Asian Americans, it's like I don't want all you know Asian Americans to all have one position on something because they have their own prejudices based on capitalism. So how do you navigate right being the one i know you worked in immigrant rights work and you know it was predominantly spanish speaking and i know that you don't you have some knowledge but not a, a super good working knowledge where you can just be able to participate but how do you deal with that where you're in subtle and, and blatant ways not just in immigrant rights but in other places where as an asian american woman right and a radical that you get silenced, that you're not, you know, they're, they're trying to keep you quiet for all the things that you represent. Yes, those, those are very, very uh, real issues and tough issues that um, I've faced as a uh, revolutionary feminist and that I should only speak for uh, Chinese or other Asian Americans and such, but that is not really something. Well, I fought against that because if I have a voice and other people have voices to speak out, why do we, why is it that we can only speak only to the fact that, oh, because I'm just, Great, or because I'm Chinese. Oh, and then and then the whole thing is that when you look at the differences uh, in our ethnicities and our racial backgrounds, uh, whether your ancestors came from Europe or uh, whether they came from Africa or whether they came from South America and other parts of the world, it's almost as if that um, you can you have to stay within. Well, maybe one example um, I could give is that um, Emily Wu Yamazaki, uh, one of my comrades and uh, dear friends and sister activists, has said, she's like, you know, I, she says, um, I'm queer, uh, but on Monday, I'm queer. On Tuesday, I'm Chinese. On Wednesday, I'm also Korean. And then on Friday, I'm uh, I, I'm a worker and such. And Emily very clearly spoke out about that. And I had to, well, you know, that's really true because um, the multiracial organizing that we have to do is because of those issues. And then why should we be boxed in into one thing or one ethnicity uh, or, or be limited by that just because you are this and then you should keep quiet. And that really, really gets my goat. And it gets, it makes me so upset and angry because it, it it's happened since the day I was a child. And, um, you know, when I, I, I took, there was a class and, or a workshop or something at Laney College. And I was, uh, the instructor was asking us to, put there was a board and there were these holes and some square and some round and um, we were ch checking on our hot hand eye coordination and dexterity and all those kinds of things and I'll be damned if I wasn't told 
and I was still pretty young. And uh, but so I told that I couldn't do it because I was a girl. And um, and then on the writing part, a professor at San Francisco State. I was an adult, but I was taking this class, and and um, I read my first poems, what I thought were poems, and after I read um, a poem that was critical of the uh, Miss Chinatown USA contest because of the sexist uh, implications of what it means to run for a beauty contest based on presentation and performance. So he said, well, you know, once you've written an angry poem, you should throw it away. And I thought, oh my God, I will never write again. I know that I cannot do it. But luckily I, I, I was, I told that to my uh, friends in feminist studies at San Francisco State and said, you don't have to listen to him. So every step along the way, we have battles, and that's just not my battle, but it's the battle of others. And you know what? We've got to do something about it, and that's what keeps me going. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fighting, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's like we're yeah. able to keep continuing because you're not just sitting there. If we keep getting beaten down, beaten down, and not fighting back, we're not getting rejuvenated. And I was not a fighter ever. See, I would not, I would not have known that. <laughs> I don't think anybody <laughs> is on this. No, no, no. 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 But that's <laughs> not what we have. So actually, that's a good lesson, right? We yes. can learn to yeah. be fighters. And it's through life's experiences, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. And then, yeah. but to see that your issues are not just your work. Yeah. Let me talk about an arena that you're also familiar with and also have, a, have done work in, right? Speaking of fighting, the labor movement, right? The labor movement is such an important place for, um, for activists, for workers to participate in, to do struggle in, right? Because it's where we're seeing class consciousness playing outside, playing itself into um, some class struggle, Right when you're taking on the bosses. So talk about you know what it was like to um, be one of the founding members of UPTI, uh, University of Professional and Technical Employees, um, which is a union that represents uh, thousands of professional um, employees throughout the University of California system. Also my former union too. So <laughs> thank you for helping to find it, found it. But you know talk about us. Talk about your labor issues because again. The core of, to me, who you are as a poet is your working class background, sensibility, um, being, right? You have taught me so much about how do we avoid falling into the individualism, the careerism, the um, I'm just going to go it alone or I'm just going to keep quiet so I can get a promotion, you know, those pressures that are on us. Well, I think just a little bit of uh, background is that I never was an ambitious kid. I was um, happy with, I think, what I call kind of routine. And of course, you know, think about just growing up in a Chinese American family. And I said, okay, and, you know, it's not like, oh, I'm just going to be well behaved. Uh, you don't grow up. To that. I, but listen, you, your parents have a lot to say about uh, how, how you're shaped. And um, so when I didn't have a chance to go to college as a um, at a, what do you call a normal time, and then I had a chance to go to school uh, as an adult and working for Bethlehem Steel Corporation, which had an educational assistance program, which allowed me to take classes, and my boss signed the application for me to go, and I was supposed to take classes for connected to how I could uh, help 
Bethlehem Steel in the sales office of the General Services Department and said, and uh, so I signed up classes for feminism and, <laughs> and I signed up classes for Asian American studies and I signed up classes for um, uh, creative writing and, and literature and such. And those were my interests. And I said, oh, you know, when I, 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 I went to see Miss Summer's Nice Dream and I was poking my sister who, Flo, who had gone to Cal and such, and she said, I keep saying, Flo, I don't understand what they're talking about. And she's like, Shh, I'll tell you later. Then I realized, okay, I gotta go to school and I'll go. And when I had a chance to go, then I get, then I faced a lot of different obstacles. So it's it's the the labor part, I think, and I'm really, really happy that um you know, I'm not happy that I was a wage slave so much. Yes, I was a wage slave, but at the same time. Uh, what I learned from being a worker in an in an office mostly, and uh, making sure that everything ran smooth, and not just making coffee, believe me. And it's it's the things that I learned, I think, as a uh, an office worker, um, as a secretary, as an administrative assistant, would really, really help me with to learn to be an organizer, even though you don't get any appreciation, certainly don't get paid for that, and, or paid very, very low. So the working class perspective is actually from my life experiences, and yet, you know, so uh, during the um, uh, panel discussion uh, on uh, at the, this bridge event, um, I was making the connection, I think, on why the voices of this bridge were still relevant. But I also said, you know what, it's not that I'm sitting here on stage and, oh, you know, get all these congratulations and, 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 um, appreciation for writing something uh, 40 years ago, but that as a working woman uh, for so many years, I'm thinking of my paid, so-called paid working life uh, uh, after 46 years, and I said, you know, we, we can't even, we couldn't even put on this celebration of this bridge call my back without workers. And I had, to, I had to acknowledge that because I come from that. I mean, everything that we do, I mean, if, if people didn't seal envelopes and people didn't make copies, if people didn't uh, do the thinking and the writing, but the tasks that are association, associated with that, the material needs that we do to need to support or we're doing that connection came for me. So, and then I, uh, before I, I get too far off the beaten path here is that um, as a, a working class woman, I will never, never forget where I came from through my experience because it was not easy to be a worker and, and, and being, you know, being treated to uh, for a lunch at, um, for two hours for National Secretary's Day, and that they don't pay you, and they don't, you don't even have decent time for for lunch, and 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 that uh, oh, how come you took such a long break, and those kinds of things that make me that connected to how important our labor is, and how unvalued or devalued the labor is not just hands, and it's not just legs with the combination of hands, legs, body, and mind, the kind of work that we do and how we are uh, then, you know, kick no. off the bus or wherever it is that we are fighting to be whole human beings and being told that we cannot be that. That's, that's to me, it really pushes me. <sighs> Workers, yeah. we count and we're gonna make that we are the ones that will make those changes and we need that. We need the leadership and we need the, um, uh, the wherewithal to say that 
look, don't don't put it on, don't put it on us that because we are who we are, that we're at fault because we're poor, or we are at fault because uh, we are uh, brown or yellow or black or white. Right, that's right. Thank you. Uh, we're sort of winding up a little bit, so I just uh, a <laughs> couple more questions, and then you know, kind of leave it to you to uh, any closing remarks. But um, if you don't mind me uh, telling folks your age, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nellie is an elder. <laughs> oh, <laughs> an elder. <laughs> Let's leave it at that, okay? But so, and you have so many years of experience. You're still going strong in the sense of your belief and in your commitment to revolutionary ideas and program. You're still going strong in the Freedom Socialist Party, you know, which is a party that is over 50 years old. Um, and given that we're at this, you know, precipice of human history as to what's going to happen next, right? What are what are some of your thoughts on what next? Where do we go? Um, advice, insights on how do you keep going? Because you know, there's been times, as I know, throughout your life, right, and throughout time, where the going gets tough. But as they say, the tough get going, and you're one of the tough, and you've gotten going. Um, <laughs> whatever. But you know, anything. I I think people would like to. To know from you, what is it that that keeps you going, and what is your hope, and uh, you know, for for this next period and the future? Wow, that's not an easy one, Nancy. But I think that I want so much. I think to just be really a part of this country. I really have always, I think, wanted to be a rural citizen. And, and it started so many years ago as someone who was also thinking about, oh, you know, I, 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 one day I'm gonna sit up there and have intellectual discussions with people. Um, there's something about how the movies and how books uh, affected my growing up and developing into a person that was who was not political in any way and who also thought that I would survive just because I will do what I was told or how I should be instead of saying, well, you have a voice, use it, and, and, and many of those related things. So it's, it's not like this world is perfect and it never will be perfect, but perfect in which sense. <laughs> But if we are sending people who come to the United States back to their countries, and I don't have to, I don't want to say his name, you know, and as if other countries were these shithole countries, et cetera, and that's why they come here. But then it would, when, 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 and we're all immigrants. Me, I, I'm a daughter of immigrants who have fought to survive and, and to have a better life. So I think that it boils down to really doing something to make our lives better. Not for us, not for me alone, or only for Asian Americans, or only for Black, and only for uh, Brown and and uh, and other people, and that our lives can be so much better if if our if the system will not 
you know, put the, uh, the racism and the sexism and other issues on us so that we think that we cannot do anything about it making a, a better world for all of us. And so those, those things are very important to me because it's, it's a, well, what else am I gonna do? And I'm not downing um, the work, you know, that mothers and fathers and, and, and guardians and, and teachers and, and, and uh, construction workers, all kinds of people, what, what we do, but how do we really make our lives better? And I know that the answer for me and the answer for many of us is that we have to have a economic system that will allow us to meet all of our needs and not just for the 1% or the top 3% mm -hmm. and um, that our lives for dignity and for equality and beauty I think that's really an important part, I think, of what I'm uh, motivated by is that I've always looked for beauty, not in just the physical or the visual, but also the of what we do with our lives and our bodies and how that then comes up in sharing our resources when this country is the richest in the world and we are telling people that they can only earn, you know, 80 cents for a woman and less for, for a woman of color and blacks. So it's, it's just so many things that we can't just, I, I can't just say it in so many words, but it's hard. I mean, I'm just gonna keep writing and fighting and I, I wanna do that as part of the movements for the changes that we need. And that means that that revolution is not going to happen today and it's not going to happen tomorrow. But you know what? What else is there to do but to fight to make those changes real and to see that human beings who are not suffering have to escape to somewhere else because we have to do it as work. we are on Earth. Thank you so much. And uh, with that, we'll end our part of it. But it's been a wonderful afternoon, and I'm glad we had an opportunity to uh, for you to share some of your many uh, stories and experiences, and pass it on words of wisdom as well. So we really miss them. Thank you. Um, also. No, in a few minutes. But also, people should um, stay on because we will be having a discussion with um, with Nelly. Um, I think we have, uh, I'll turn it over to Sarah, and then she'll turn it back to me. Thank you so much, Nelly. That was very enlightening. I mean, I just love seeing the revolution through your eyes. <laughs> um, so before we open up our discussion on that fascinating and empowering activist history, we have an announcement from FSP member Christine Browning joining us from Monterey. Yay! Hey. Greetings from Chile, Monterey, California. Thank you all for coming today. Um, can you hear her voice? No, no. Can you hear me? Almost. Hello, can you hear me okay? Okay, this is a very- I'm noticing there's a little reverb. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. Everybody, can you hear me?
Hello? Hello? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay. Hang on a half second. Okay, this is a very special day for us. Not only are we able to honor Nellie Wong and hear about her long and productive life as a social activist, we are also able to share it with many of our party's branches at large members and numerous other individuals who have joined us here today. Last year, I wrote a poem for Nellie's birthday, and it seems fitting to recite it to you today. Um, so this is called A Song for Nellie Wong. Sing a song for Nellie Wong. Hear the sound of her grace and culture, grace and beauty, stability, grace in movement, grace in standing still, softness and toughness, wise and wonderful, stalwart revolutionary socialist feminist. Poetry on her pages come from a heart full of concern for the world and humanity. Her voice is soothing, her laughter infectious, wise from tenacity for learning and experience, ever giving and sharing, ever fighting for fairness. Nellie graces our ship of comrades, graces the world with her being and with her poetic song. Thank you. Nellie is an incredible revolutionary woman, and she belongs to a rather incredible organization, the Freedom Socialist Party, which has for over 56 years worked for numerous, numerous justice and equality issues, just as we are doing today with our organizing for reproductive justice. It's hard work, but it makes our lives meaningful and fulfilling. We are all volunteers in this organization and donate what we can to keep our socialist machine in motion. We also depend on our friends and acquaintances to help us do our work by contributing. Uh, we depend on you to keep our well-oiled machine by donating some of your hard-earned dollars. So it is my task today to ask you to kindly open your wallets and help us do our work by contributing. No amount is too small, or for that fact, no amount is too big. If you are in the hall, we can pass a hat for cash or checks. Those of you on Zoom can mail a check made out to the Freedom Socialist Party or make a donation on PayPal. The information for these are shown in the chat. Anything you can give will help us do our vital work in building a better world. Thank you. And thank you, Nellie, for sharing your story with us today. Yeah, pledges to the chat, so thanks so much. Um, I will be announcing our total amount raised uh, near, near the end of our meeting. So it is my pleasure now to open up the discussion. And so we can pick Nellie's brains about, about
All right. Uh, thank you, Christine, and thank you, everybody, for your generosity. It's much appreciated, and we'll be put to very good use, guaranteed. <laughs> All right. Uh, questions, comments? Um, uh, someone's going to help me with those in the chat who have their hands up. So we have uh, someone in in house, uh, Mike. If you'll go up to the uh, laptop and then everybody can see you. Hi, I just wanted to ask Nellie if during her career as an activist. Uh, I recall an incident where somebody was aggressive towards you in Civic Center Plaza a couple of years ago, and I wondered if you've ever felt threatened or in danger for speaking out on your issues. Well, I'll figure that. Yes, um, it was just it was just a couple of years ago, and were we not rallying and speaking out um, for? Was there a abortion right now? A May Day rally. Oh, a May Day rally. That's right. And uh, I think what um, you what you were saying was uh, did did I feel threatened when that happened? Uh, no, I I I really did not feel threatened. I think because of what I was saying, I I think also at that point where uh, the man in a wheelchair was trying to disrupt what I was saying, but I also thought that he was not um, really opposing or speaking against what I was speaking. He was just being belligerent because of maybe perhaps because of his illness. Uh, and, and he did seem like he wasn't all there kind of a thing. So I think the question you're asking me is a good one because maybe when I was younger, I, I would have felt threatened if someone approached me like that. But um, I knew that I was also surrounded by uh, my brother and sister activists and people in the community at Civic Center, and it's a public square. I mean, is it, anyone can be there. And as, just as this particular person had a right to be there, but also we had a right to be there. So I think I felt that I knew, I knew that it, I, I did not need to be, I wasn't scared, I mean, I mean, nothing scares me anymore when you think about it. And it's, it's just a bit, wow, you know, you can see, even at the, at the risk of uh, being, uh, being physically attacked, but, uh, and that has not actually happened to me uh, often at all, but I think it's the other kinds of attacks that we also need to deal with. Not, I'm not putting down you know, what, what happens if, if a person is physically attacked. But, and he did not try to touch me or shove me or push me, but he was in my face and I know, oh, okay, face to face, we'll deal with it. Right, we've got some folks on Zoom. We have Debbie and then Yolanda, so go ahead, Debbie. Uh, 
Is the sound working now? Okay. Um, Nellie and Nancy, I absolutely love that conversation. Thank you. Um, Nellie, your, your internationalism absolutely sparkles in everything that you write and you say, and you are an international traveler as well. Um, you'd remember in 2009, you came here to Melbourne, Australia, and um, you were in hot demand. Uh, you addressed a packed out radical women forum on women and revolution. And um, you really connected with everyone here. Um, given that nationalism is such a problem, it's capitalism's chief weapon. Um, can you say something about how important internationalism is to you as a revolutionary um, and also as a writer and speaker? She wanted to know if you could speak to internationalism and how she was, Debbie was saying that your internationalism comes through and that, you know, made mention of your visit to Melbourne um, a few years ago and also the importance of internationalism and what that means to you. I think, uh, Yes, that that uh, trip to visit the uh, visit Melbourne, Australia, uh, was also eye-opening for me as someone who has not traveled a lot. I've been to a few places, but, but you know, I, I always thought of I'd like to travel the whole world, and actually, if I could just fly on my own over the whole world, I would do that. But the thing that uh, connects, I think, for me, and um, as a feminist and as a socialist and a working woman, etc., that it, it just makes real common sense to me that a person is not, a human being is not limited uh, to her own particular background and her own life. And that connection, I think, is looking at what's happening to the world's people and that the issues that we fight in the United States are also issues that we are fighting in other parts of the world. And if capitalism is global, and it certainly is, then that's what we need to do is build for socialism globally, internationally, because we are connected as human beings that if we are living in this world, we have to live together, organizing and working together, and that our country of origin um, does not limit our um, capabilities and abilities and our fight to fight for all human beings and all working people. So that internationalism, I think the connection I also want to just make from a very um, seemingly a personal one is that I've also thought of being a person of the world when I was young. So I think that's why I always gravitated towards film and books that spoke about other people 
of the world and not just my own. And so that is connected to what happens in, uh, say, to the Aborigine um, people in Australia happens to the people here who are people of color and indigenous people in this country that they are connected. And to me, that is what helps me to see uh, the, what we fight for is for internationalism and that internationalism has, has to be because uh, of the world's ills and the world's problems are not limited to only one country. And that is what we need to do is connect on that basis and that we do it in an organized way and fight back against the oppression of the systems that hold us back. Okay, I think what we'll do is look, we have uh, a lineup of folks. So let's maybe we'll take a few questions and then or comments and then we'll we'll have you respond. So I have Yolanda, Na, Luma, and Helen. Okay, so we'll set I can't hear you. Can't hear you. Go ahead again. I have an, I'm... Go ahead, Yolanda. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is Yolanda from Los Angeles with the Comrades of Color Caucus. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Just shake your head. Yes. Okay. I'll go ahead then, even though I can't hear you. Um, Nellie, thank you so much for doing this. Nancy, thank you so much for moderating and asking such insightful questions. Um, I've traveled to many conferences with Nellie since the early days and always have been honored to work with her and, and Merle and others. And what I found about us fighting to speak is that we're encouraging other women of color to speak out. So Nellie, you set that example and that's very important because we're not taught to do that. And um, you doing that is so very, very important. And we also set the example on how to deal with cultural nationalists who raise their culture or whatever, you know, their gender, their sex, their nationality above the unity of the working class, right? So. We teach how we can unite the class as socialist feminists. And that's really important when we're opposing the cultural nationalists. So I just wanted to add that to your comment, which I thought was very a good question to have asked. And, um, and I think uniting the working class as socialist feminists not only revolutionizes others, but it gives us a purpose and a way to fulfill it. Thank you. I don't know if you want to comment on that later, but just I just want to emphasize that point, Nellie. Thank you. All right. Yeah, we'll take it. We'll take a few more questions and then we'll have Nellie respond. So I have Na, Luma, Helen. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Nancy. And thank you, Nellie and Nancy, for this conversation and also to the comrades who made it happen or continue to make it happen. Um, I, my name is Na. I'm a member of the Freedom Socialist Party New York City branch and representing for the Comrades of Color Caucus as well. I was thinking right before this event about how when I hear about people talking about elders, especially when it comes to political work, it's often almost in this passive way that the elder imparts wisdom and that the younger generations are receiving and accepting it and that's it. And that's the most active they are is just to pass on that wisdom. Whereas I think about Nellie and I think about other older comrades within the party and that it's a very active role. You're not just imparting wisdom and experience. You're there shoulder to shoulder with the younger generations teaching us how to do this, teaching us how to organize, how to build, how to build relationships, how to work across these ways that we're divided. And something that I, I don't hear enough of in our party is that not only are we 
recognizing the need for multiracial, multigender, multisexuality, all the ways that we're divided under capitalism. But our intergenerational nature is so powerful because we know that capitalism uses ageism as a way to exploit or push out people who are older um, when they're not as able to be heavily exploited as when they were working. So all that to say is I'm so grateful for this event um, and a reminder of like how we work across these ways that we're divided um, and that Nelly, you're not just imparting your wisdom, but you, I know you're right there shoulder to shoulder in this fight. So thank you. Yeah, Luma, go ahead. Um, this is Luma in Tucson. Hi, Nelly. Um, I wanted to ask you to talk a little bit about how you see the connection between art and politics, because there are those who say art should be apolitical, and yet your writing, your poems reach people politically in a powerful way. So if you could talk a little more about that, I think it would be great. Did, did you call me? There was an echo. Okay, thank you. Nelly and, and Nancy, thank you for this wonderful program. This is Helen Gilbert tuning in from Seattle. And I'm the National Radical Women Organizer. And I wanted to thank you, Nelly, on behalf of all the Radical Women Sisters for your, your inspiration and dedication and showing us how um, political life is a wonderful way of life and putting your all into it and showing us how that's just a, a, a joyous way to live one's life. And you're a testament to the power of the struggle. So thank you so much. Okay, we'll take one more. Oh, hi, um, this is uh, Christina. Um, I wanna echo what, what Helen just said. That was um, my, my question about writing or Luma, what, what Luma was saying that writing, you know, I love how you said that you, you write um, on your experience and a lot of it was political and it is a reflection of what's happening in, in real life. And I think that I owe you and a lot of people owe you a really great thought, a really great thank you and gratitude because writing is powerful and it has a potential to influence people. And I think that a lot of the, this a lot has been written about critical race theory. And I think that there's also this uh, thing where a lot of the, it has been written a lot of the younger generations, the Generation X, the, um, or, or have an unfavorable view of the United States, understandably so. And a lot of them are pro-socialists. And I would like to add a lot of those in our older generation also have an unfavorable view of the United States and are pro-socialist. But I think I wanna know what your thoughts are on the current attempts, the uh, current attempts to, um, to uh, control on what is, published and control what is taught to um, in education. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, we probably don't have a lot of time left, but um, here we go. Uh, on, on cultural nationalism, I really uh, appreciated what uh, Yolanda raised and, and it did not come into a specific uh, discussion or in, in, in my comments or uh, 
through uh, Nancy's questions that she put out there, but I think so much of my activism and um, what I fight for is has never been on seeing that um, one racial or one ethnic group is better than another. We're all better people. We're all, but I think the the, the problems of uh, cultural nationalism is when, say, one group of color um, say that well we have to only deal with race, our race, and if it's on on the basis of my particular race or my particular color or my particular um, ethnic identity is what comes first. No, no, no. It is based on who we are as human beings of whatever ethnicity or uh, uh, background, other background that we come from because we're not going to solve problems just because if, if as an Asian American and, and, and fighting the, and, and the racism that was perpetrated or exacerbated uh, by uh, uh, Asian people uh, due to the COVID uh, pandemic and the blaming of uh, the pandemic uh, being started by Chinese or other Asians. <laughs> that, that's all wrong, it's all bad. So those kinds of things that can come up, you, you, you need to see yourself and we need to see ourselves as human beings that come from all, you know, you could be pink or you could be yellow or you could be black and you can be purple, it doesn't really matter on the color part of it, or uh, specifically uh, contained within our cult cultural or racial background. So, because we have to consider class, we have to consider of who we are as human beings. And on the art and politics, oh, Bloom, I'm really glad you, you, you raised that because it's really one of my favorite topics, if you will, uh, because I think as, as a writer and um, someone who, who was told that she, uh, she couldn't, I couldn't write because uh, I was too angry. Well, yeah, I was angry, but uh, well, well, a lot of people do things out of anger and a lot of people do different things out of um, oppression or being discriminated against. And whatever, or you know, just uh, planning how we're going to cross the street for he for heaven's sake. So um, the writing of the connection to art and politics to me is crucial, so crucial to our very beings and to our lives as fighters and and really great and wonderful people that we are. I really want to say that because the, if we didn't, if the writing was just, oh, let's just write to, you know, what language, or if we wrote only to um, venge our rage or, or, or to, to stick to, not that we should stick to the topics when we write, but that the writing and the political activism really for me is, is together. It's a combination. It's a beautiful blending of the work that we can do and what I feel that I can contribute towards uh, the movements and towards um, really finding the beauty in the connection of what we do and what we think and what we believe and what we eat. So, thank you for your um, comments too on, uh, on the current 
topics and I was just thinking in particular about um, the whole uh, controversy on the teaching of critical race theory in our schools and not everyone teaches that and not every university uh, has this topic but it's it's been raging through through the internet and through uh, printed media etc et and so I think that um, what the right wing and the conservatives and the white supremacists in particular are concerned about is that uh, we're going to teach how bad white people are. Uh, and we know that that is not really the case of your ethnicity or your whiteness or our being people of color. It's, it's not based on that. It's, really teaching so our young people, our kids and our cousins and all the dear young people that we are raising and educating and need to expose is the reality and the truth of what this country as well as others have done right. to so yeah, you don't say, well, you can't, it's because it's not it's not true that it was only white people who enslaved black people. It's the, it's the slavery, the labor slavery is connected to the haves and the have-nots and the profit seeking corporations and the banks and the robber barons of the world situated or combined, I think, in the, the system that says that money and war and accumulation of material wealth will only belong to certain people and to build any country, then we're gonna enslave workers. And this is what they have done to all workers, not only to blacks, but it has to be connected and shown that that's, that is the reality and that's the truth of where, uh, how, I mean, I, I, I've always been a laborer and I, I'm not ashamed of that. I, no, yeah. I'm, I hated that I have to help my bosses get ahead yeah. instead of helping others. But then that realization then comes to being is that how do we get ahead, but not necessarily um, on uh, on profit making. And I mean, Jeff Bezos. I mean, <laughs> so you're flying off in space. Yes, yeah, just at least you you told the truth when you said you workers have sent me there. And so what do we do about that? That's the important thing. All right. Uh, are there any other questions, comments? All right. Uh, seeing none, I will. Sorry, my sister, did you have your hand up? It's a really short one. OK, so come on up here. <laughs> All right, we have one more. Wonderful. Tess, 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 can folks online here? Oh, I guess I don't know. Anyway, um, Nelly, thank you. Wonderful. It's unbelievable as a worker, especially. Um, my name is Moises from San Francisco, supporter of the Freedom Socialist Party. Question. Joseph Biden is the U.S. president right now. Honorable Kamala Harris is the vice president. Oh, Kamala, who I'm not always sure, I don't see her, but with respect to all. That said, it's a Democrat Party White House right now. Can you say a little bit about, as we fight for these issues like reproductive rights for women and immigration rights, la la la, you know, Bessel's being up in space instead of NASA continuing, you know, trying to privatize space. 
Why is this, do you think, happening when we should be moving forward instead of reiterating and going backwards stuff that we've been fighting for for decades? Thank you. Well, instead of things are grouping for working people and poor and disabled people uh, in this country, it's, it's, it's getting worse. And, and that's to say that to, um, with the Democratic Party as well as the Republican Party uh, upholding uh, prophets as king. Even use that word back that making money and enriching only a few that is really uh, a part of what the capital system does. So, if we didn't have the twin parties of capitalism, how much further can we go? And we would definitely, and that's why the uh, what, what we need to do is build for that socialist feminist system and society that will see that everyone's needs are met and that we all have a place to live and thrive in this world. And that it's not only for those few who are supposedly so smart that they're the only ones that know how to make money while the rest of the world suffers and struggle to put food on the table and to be educated and not get so sick because of the environmental impact put on by the greed for profits and for only a few people in this world to be rich and well off. Thank you everybody for your comments and uh, for uh, participating. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, so we are going to have a couple of community announcements, and uh, I just want to tell everyone in Zoomland there um, that we raised over four hundred and fifty-five dollars with this event, and um, you know I know that personally we will be putting that to very good use. So thanks so much, everyone, for your support. So we're going to have just a couple of uh, community announcements, and then a post-event discussion. Uh, for anyone who wants to hang on, so thank you so much. Any announcements time? At the raffle. At the raffle. Mm -hmm. Are we having community announcements about? Okay, yes, we are having, we, we still have a uh, study group going on until January 25th, uh, Revolutionary Integration, Linking the Struggles for Black Freedom and Socialism. Um, so, you know, this was a great talk about the intersectionality, well, don't use that word, the multi-issue of the multi-issues of the working class. And, uh, and in, that's one of the things we discuss in our, in our study group uh, about revolutionary integration. So if you haven't picked up a copy of revolutionary integration um, here at New Valencia Hall or through Red Letter Press, that's something you can do. Um, and you can also Sign up for the study group that's still going on. Um, that's Tuesday, 7, 8, 30 through January 25th. You can see more details about that on socialism.com. Um, so we're just getting our raffle information together. All right, where should I say? Nelly, get Nelly to pick the tickets. Oh, oh yeah. I don't like this. Okay. Uh, no, speak up. It's all good. Yeah, you yes, got all the tickets in the last year. Give it a good deal. Working people. Yeah, we're going to do two draws. 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 Yeah, we're going to do two
and we sold 79 tickets. Wow. <laughs> 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 first up, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Not a little because I pronounced All right. All right, so the first ticket I have, so I'll, I'll ask the uh, the folks in the room to look at your tickets first, because I think this one is one of the kids in the room, uh, is it ends in 902. Any folks in the room with that ticket? Woo! Oh! Yay! What is your name? Mike. Mike, thank you very much. You have one breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, uh, no kiss, don't no spare. If you if you uh, want to get that book, you can buy it on Red Letter Press. So next up, we have Talking Back, signed and introduced by Nelly Wong. And for this ticket, we have let's see. Oh, this might also be someone else in the room. So oh, oh my goodness! Nine three one. So ticket holders, nine three your ticket, 931. Not in the room? Okay, maybe it's in the box. Oh, yeah, I think it is. The suspense is pulling us. Okay, I think I'll it. 931, it's from Amy. Oh! oh Amy. 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 She's a Zoom. You have one talking back. Oh, oh, there she is. Oh, excellent. Oh. All right, thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, Renee. Cheers. All right, that was a uh, that was a wonderful final experience. So thank you, Ray, for running your first raffle with us. I mean, that was okay. So um, if you are you know new to learning about FSP and you want to continue our our marvelous discussion, um, please stay on Zoom, and um, it's going to be just a few minutes while we settle everything, but you know, we're happy to have you and happy to have you continue to learn about Nelly and the FSP. So please stick around if you would like to stick around for a party related discussion with Nelly and it. Thank you.